Welcome to church. This is what we do around here, and I'm thrilled that you. Uh, I'm thrilled that you're a part of it. I'm Pastor Brad, and on behalf of the elders and the staff, we are welcoming you to Christmas season at California Community Church. We have next week, Christmas weekend, I'm going to talk about that a little later. The next week, we have New Year's weekend, so there's a lot of good going on. I'd love you to be a part of every bit of that. Now, some of you, some of you, you hear all this, you see all this, merry, cheery Christmas, and you're like, bah humbug, right? Because in your life, in your heart, you're not feeling that way. Like, you might have put up your Christmas tree, you might even have lights on your Christmas tree, but nothing feels decorative or alive or lit inside of you. You don't feel like one of the Merry Christmas people this season. You might have come in today with all kinds of sadness. That may even be the reason you came to church, because you knew you needed something in your life. The loss that you're processing, the questions that you have, the doubts that you're filled with, the grief that you have experienced this year. I mean, everybody else is cranking up the Christmas music. You're trying to turn it down or turn it off. We're in what's called the Advent season. How many of you grew up in a religious background and you heard the word Advent? Like, not everybody did, but, you know, most of you have. Advent means coming. It means coming. It's like a happy word. It's the coming of Jesus into the world. But some of you are thinking, for my advent, Brad, I don't think much good is coming my way this year because there hasn't been much good so far. And your question might be, how do I even rejoice? I mean, the last couple of years, for some of you I know, have been tough to endure. You've had a lot of loss. You've had to endure and go through a lot. And the feeling you're having with all of those emotions, I want you to know all of those emotions are actually found in the Christmas story. See, we think Christmas is just ho, 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 ha, ha, ha. That's some of it. There was joy at Christmas, but in addition to ho, 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 there was a lot of oh my, and there was a lot of oh me, and there was a lot of this doesn't feel so good. And you know, as I go through the Christmas story every year, and I do it every year, this is my 40-something Christmas as a pastor, and, and every year, you know, I just go through it again, and this year I was going through the lineage of Jesus again, and I found that even in the backstory of Jesus, like the family tree of Jesus. The family tree of Jesus is the first Christmas tree, if you want to think about it like that. And in the family tree of Jesus, we find every emotion in this room. There's a lot of happiness in the backstory of Jesus. There's a lot of confusion in the backstory of Jesus. There's a lot of, ooh, didn't know that, in the story of Jesus. And there's a lot of sadness in the story of Jesus. You open up the scriptures and you come to Advent, like the build-up to the coming of Jesus, to the birth of Jesus, the genealogy of Jesus, the family tree of Jesus, the first Christmas tree, if you will, the backstory of Jesus. And it's interesting. I got to tell you, it's interesting. The family tree of Jesus. Now, when I was a kid, we used to use a phrase to describe somebody who we thought was like crazy. And we would say about them, you're out of your tree. Like they'd say something awful, we'd say, you're out of your tree. Anybody use that phrase or is that just the South? Like I grew up in the South. You, you, you know biscuits and gravy? You know that one, right? <laughs> out of your tree is what we'd say. And the truth is, all of us in our families have someone, and we might be the one who has occasionally been out of our tree. Turn to your neighbor right now and say, it might be me. Go ahead. Turn to your neighbor and say, it might be me. She said, it might be you. All of us at one time or another have been out of our tree. I mean, how could Christmas be good, Brad? Like, if you knew my family, how could Christmas be good? If you knew my circumstances, you wouldn't think Christmas could be good. If you knew my past, Brad, you have no idea. Well, if you know my story, I might just have an idea of what most of you are going through. 
Today, I want to play off that phrase. You're out of your tree, disconnected from the tree. And I want us to spend some time looking at the family tree of Jesus. Now, last weekend, I warned you that we're going to be looking at the most boring part of the Bible. This is the stuff that naps are made of. We're going to take a deep dive into this. This has the potential to put you into a sleep coma. So I just want you to hang with me. Because hidden in this very boring list of the relatives of Jesus we're going to see something about a Christmas miracle. In the time of prophets and kings, in the time of Mary and Joseph, a person wasn't defined by their line of work. Oh, well, that's Joseph. He's a carpenter. That's not how they were defined. It wasn't, they weren't defined by their credit score. They weren't defined by their net worth or their accomplishments or, or, or uh, anything external that gave them identity. People were defined by their family. Oh, that's the son of Joseph. Yeah, well, we know everything we need to know. That's just how it was. You were known by your family name. You were identified by your family name. You were categorized by your family name. Listen, you were judged by your family. Oh, Oh, we still do a little of that, don't we? Oh, you hear somebody's family name? Oh, yeah, I, I, I know all about that family. When you look at the family tree of Jesus, the coming of Christ, you find a lot of messed up monarchs, battling brothers. You find adultery. There's some affairs in there. You find more than one skeleton in the closet. You find all kinds of dysfunction. When you look at the genealogy of Jesus, it doesn't look like a holy family. Looks like murderers. Looks like abusers. In the list of Jesus' relatives, you find the powerless. You find the oppressed, the marginalized, the messy. You find the forgotten. You find foreigners. You find outsiders. You find immigrants. You find those who are happy, and you find those who are deeply hurting. Just sit for a minute at the foot of Jesus' Christmas tree, and the kind of family you come from is the kind of family he came from. And listen to me. Yours is the kind of family he came for. I want you to hear that. So I'm going to take a big risk right now, a big risk right now, and I'm going to read the genealogy of Jesus. And I don't want to hear you snoring. I don't want to hear that stuff. If your neighbor is snoring, you have pastor's permission to turn their other cheek. That's, that's right in the Bible. That's right in the Bible. Turn the other cheek. Who promises to not mentally check out on me this morning? Hang with me. We're getting into it. I didn't put it all on your notes, but it's found in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 to 17, genealogy of Jesus. I'm going to bring it up on the screen. We can look at it together. Here we go. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Abinadab. Uh, Abinadab and the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of King David. Woo, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram. <gasps> Jehoram, the father of Uzziah. Who's hanging with me so far? I might need oxygen, right? Here we go. Uzziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Ammon. Ammon, the father of Josiah. And Josiah, 
the father of Jeconia and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconia was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of Abehud. Abehud, the father of Eliakim. Eliakim, the father of Azor. Azor, the father of Zadok. Zadok, the father of Achim. They had some funky names back then. Achim, the father of Elihud. Elihud, the father of Eliezer. Eliezer, the father of Mathan. Mathan, the father of Jacob. We're not done. And Jacob, here we go, some names you know. Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who's called what? Messiah. It's called Messiah. Thus, there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to Messiah. genealogy of Jesus. I mean, there's a little bit of everyone in there. You need some immigrants? Check. You need some outsiders? Check. You need some folks who are marginalized? Check. You need the grieving, the limping, the wounded, the scarred, the afraid? Check, 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 and check. The family of Jesus, the Christmas tree of Jesus, actually reflects all of humanity, which means, listen to me, that Christmas is for everyone. Christmas is for everyone. At the time when Jesus was born, only men in traditional genealogies were listed. Only men. But in the genealogy of Jesus, there's not just his mom, Mary, But there are four other women found in the Christmas tree of Jesus. Women who were foreigners, who felt like outsiders, who would have been considered have-beens or never-been, people who were weary, taken advantage of, objectified, and not seen. The heartbreaking family lineage of Jesus throws a lifeline to all of our heartbroken families. See, whatever kind of family you came from is exactly the kind of family Jesus came from and exactly the kind of Jesus, the the family that Jesus came what? That Jesus came for. For instance, in the lineage of Jesus, we saw the name Jacob. Jacob and his brothers. Some of you know the story. Jacob had a son, Joseph. That was his favorite son. Now, he had other sons, but his favorite son was Joseph. And to show his love to Joseph, he gave his son a coat of many colors. Maybe you've seen the Broadway musical. <laughs> right? The other brothers hated Joseph because their father so loved Joseph. And so they took him out in the desert and they were going to kill him. But instead of killing him, they sold him to a traveling slave caravan, knowing that his life would be short in that kind of life anyway. And they go home and they tell their father, oh, our brother had an accident. Your favorite son, Joseph, is dead. You know any families where there's a favorite one? among all the rest, and a little jealousy involved. And then they go back, and now their father lives with this feeling that his son is dead, but that was a deception. That was a family lie. That was a a secret that these brothers held. Anybody here know a family where there's been a little lying, a little secrecy? Don't point. Just raise your hand. You can stand around the Christmas tree, your family tree, and there's probably a little bit of Jacob in there. Cheaters and deceivers, a family line that looks like a mess, and from that family, God brings Messiah. That's all you need today. I want you to hear God speaking. No matter how messed up you feel, how left out you feel, how lost you feel, how complicated it all feels. God is close to you. God came for you. 
You are not out of hope. You have not run out of second chances, fresh mercy, and new starts. How many of you know that's some good news? The lineage of Jesus explodes the myth that a person is diminished because of their failures or mistakes from the past. See, culture will tell you, oh, you made mistakes, you failed, well, now you're diminished. You can't have as big of a future because of your past. But if you look at the past of Jesus, you would have to conclude that Jesus would only have a little bit of a future. And yet he is the name of all, above all names, seated at the right hand of God. Nothing about his past could diminish his future. And nothing about your past can diminish your future. Jesus' family tree shows us that even if you're out of your tree, you're part of God's Christmas tree. And every second chancer has a pathway to a fully abundant life. The story of Jesus, the story of Jesus, the family tree of Jesus, shows us that second chances are not second class. Anybody happy about that? Anybody happy about that? Yeah. If you desire to live in the confident authority of your second chance, the story of Jesus exists for you. I mean, welcome to a meeting of Second Chancers Anonymous. Hi, I'm Brad. I know some of you have been to those meetings. Hi, I'm Brad. That's how we do it. That's how we do it. I'm a Second Chancer. When I woke up from my third suicide attempt, which followed two years of broken dreams and a broken life, I knew God woke me up for a purpose. But at the time, I didn't know what it was. But now I know you're my purpose. So these days, I live to dispel the myth that your past choices forever damage your future. That's a myth. Because God can do anything in your future. He can do anything with anyone, anytime he wants. I don't care what your past is. I don't care how broken it was. That's good news at Christmas. The lineage of Jesus proves that. My life message builds on this mindset that everything's a lesson. We're just a work in progress, and the future can be significantly better than the past. And collectively, we're all second chancers. We know we're the ones who not only bounce back, but we can bounce better. Do you believe that today? Who understands every mistake made, every lesson learned, every success celebrated, every crippling stagnation experience are lessons for others and for yourself to learn faster the next time. Just be better the next time. Just go farther the next time. Who's with me so far? You have not run out of the possibility of experiencing real joy in your life for your future. Don't give up on yourself. Because Christmas proves the past is in the past. And you still have a clean, bright future. You have not run out of possibility of experiencing real joy this Christmas. You can know you're going to make it because you have a maker who came to earth for you. The heartbreaking family lineage of Jesus throws a lifeline to every heartbroken person who's here. Whatever family you came from is like the family Jesus came from. And it's the kind of family Jesus came for. We know the story of Jacob. Joseph's story's in there. Joseph was the, or, or yeah, Joseph was the uh, apprentice who was going to lead the people of God to the promised land. Moses wasn't going to get to go. But before he led people into the promised land, he decided to send spies into the promised land just to see what they would face once they got there. What kind of challenges are there? What kind of army do they have? What kind of 
obstacles are in front of us there. While the spies were there, their lives were in danger because they're in this place where they're not wanted. And they come across a woman named Rahab. And we're actually told her occupation. It was the oldest occupation in the world. She was a prostitute. Marginalized, excluded, objectified, no doubt abused. And the scripture reads, Before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up on the roof to talk to them. And look at these first four words. I know the Lord. Just stop right there for a minute. I know the Lord has given you this land. How would she know that? Because God had revealed it to her. She must have had a relationship with God and faith in God. I know the Lord has given you this land. The Lord your God is. Look at her declaration of faith. Your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. This was not the pastor of the town. This was the prostitute of the town who's preaching this message about God. And to keep the spies from being caught in the city, they're in this upstairs room and the window is actually on the city wall and she has a scarlet colored rope that I don't know what the rope had been used for previously. Don't let your mind go there. Pastor just brought it up. She let the rope down the window so they could crawl down that rope and escape the city to safety. And before she lowered the men down, the men said, when we come back in and all of our people are going to come and take this land, and when we do, you and your family will be spared. But the way that the army will know to leave you safe, you keep this scarlet rope hanging from the window. And we know everybody in this house is to be spared. When we come back into the land... You must leave the scarlet rope hanging from the window through which you let us down. All your family members, your father, your mother, your sister, your brothers, all your relatives must be here inside this house. I accept your terms, she replied. She sent them on their way, on their way, leaving the scarlet rope hanging from the window. Now I want you to think about Rahab for a minute. Not only... Was it very unusual to have a woman listed in a genealogy back during the time of Jesus? It would have been super unusual to list somebody with a past like Rahab. God made a decision to make sure her story was there for us. I like that about God. Because he was telling Rahab, I don't care what your past is. I have a beautiful future for you. And now, thousands of years later, he's saying, I don't care what your past is. I have a beautiful future for you. And to prove it, story of Rahab. Who's with me? You need to understand, no one else in that town believed in God. No one else in that town wanted to obey God. But the one person to demonstrate faith in that town was Rahab. In a place of faithlessness and doubtfulness and godlessness, God can reveal himself wherever, whenever, to whomever. I don't know about you, but that gives me great hope at Christmas, that God can reveal himself in places like that to someone like me. I was Rahab, and some of you were too. God who is never limited by lack or restricted by the expected, God who is no respecter of persons but relentlessly pursues every prodigal child. God gives the greatest gift of faith exactly in the places where you think he won't. This is the secret of being awestruck at Christmas. You want to leave this Christmas season feeling the awe and wonder of it all. You need to believe that God is where you doubt he is. 
Where in your life right now do you doubt that God really is? Like, do you have the faith to look for him inside that crumbling marriage? Do you believe God is with that wayward child? That God exists next to your mountain of debt? That he's there by the hospital bed? Can you make room to believe in your heart that God is showing up and that God is right there in that place where most people would not expect him to be? Here's Rahab in a godless place with a godless past. Rahab, the scarlet woman with a scarlet rope. But that scarlet rope, this is kind of cool. It's the color of blood. Intentionally, it's the color of blood. That rope extends from the beginning of time all the way till today. Scarlet. That threads all through the Bible. You go back to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve realize they're naked. God sees their nakedness. First thing God does, he kills an animal. It's the first bloodshed in the Bible. And there's that scarlet color. And he took the skin of the animal and he covered their nakedness. They were saved through that scarlet rope. Let's jump to Passover. My Jewish family members know that story. The death angel is coming to Egypt. The firstborn in every house is going to die. Except for the households where a lamb had been killed and the blood of the lamb, what color? Scarlet. The blood of the lamb painted over the doorpost. And when the angel saw that scarlet color, the death angel, what? Passed over. That's where we get the name. That scarlet rope continues on through history to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus is bent and he's praying and the Bible says he was sweating great drops of blood. What color do you suppose that was? It was that scarlet rope continuing through the scriptures. And then on Calvary, Jesus goes to that Christmas tree And he hangs and he dies and he sheds his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Rahab is saved by that singular scarlet cord and it's so cool that we are too. Here's a a former woman of the night who takes her great faith. And do you know what happens to her next? She ends up marrying a Jewish prince. He was royalty. His name was Salmon. And Rahab and Salmon have a son. And the son's name is Boaz. And Boaz marries Ruth. There's another woman mentioned in the lineage of Jesus. And Ruth and Boaz have a son. And his name is Obed. And Obed has a son. And his name is Jesse. And Jesse has a son. And his name is David. And David becomes... (laughs) King David. We know about King David. What a hero. What a story. But I bet you never knew that his great, great grandmother was a prostitute. Rahab. Rahab. She was a pagan. She's only the second woman named in the great hall of fame of faith in the New Testament. There's a book in the New Testament called Hebrews. And in chapter 11, all these great men are mentioned because of their faith. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, Moses. But among those men, those legends, right in there is Rahab. This is what the scripture says about her. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies was not killed with those who were disobedient. Right in the family tree of Jesus with her great faith. You know what faith does? It's the great equalizer. It's the great eraser of our past. It's the great definer of who we are. Our past doesn't define us. Our faith defines us. 
This Christmas, where is your great faith in the work and the ways of God? Where is your great hope that God is working in you in ways that maybe you haven't even thought about until today? Maybe, maybe you spent so much time looking up at your messed up family tree that you haven't thought about Jesus' Christmas tree and how he might use your lineage for his good and that you might be right where God wants you in your life. You look at the story of Rahab and those other four women in Jesus' family tree. I mean, there's Bathsheba, who had an affair with David. Tamar, Ruth, women who were outsiders, had been abused and used, and yet they played pivotal roles in the story of God. Maybe this year, some of you are saying, Brad, I have just, I have failed. I have failed so much. I have failed so deeply. You can feel deep suffering in your life, right? And you can also feel joy at the same time. Did you know that? You can feel your shame and you can feel hope at the same time. How many of you have ever been cold and then you warmed yourself by the fire and for a minute you were both warm and cold? How many of you have ever been to a funeral and it's a sad occasion and you're grieving and you're saying goodbye, but kind of it breaks out into some laughter and you're telling stories about the family and it's a little bit then like a family reunion and you've got tears and laughter in the same room. How many of you have done that? So with your shame that you carry forward, you can also experience joy. Now how do you get joyful in your pain? How do you find joy when you're hurting? The answer is kind of simple, but the application of it is going to take your effort. You have to find gratitude. With gratitude, it's always possible to find joy in whatever situation you're in, because whatever situation you're in, you can always find something to be thankful for. Who believes that? If you look for it hard enough, if you look for it long enough, there's always something to say thank you for. What would happen to your heart if you counted all the ways God loves you? What would happen in your sorrow if you started to consider how God's perfect love drives out fear? What would happen if you began to thank him because regardless of whatever situation you're in, his grace, his love, his provision is always coming to meet you? What would happen? In this season, if you found a reason to give thanks in everything. See, God knows if we can give thanks in everything, we can get through anything. Did you hear that? Listen, this Christmas, don't let it just be about buying more gifts. Make a promise to the Lord that you'll pick up a pen this Christmas season, piece of paper this Christmas season, And you'll start listing all the gifts you already have. Start giving thanks. Start giving thanks. Have a posture of gratitude. It will radically transform your life. I mean, even science says, if you write down three things a day that you're grateful for, you will be 25% happier. Anybody want that this season, a little happier this season? All you have to do is pick up a pen. The secret of joy is just a matter of focus. And we get to choose what we focus on. What we don't have or what we do have. What isn't right or what is right. What's not a blessing, what is a blessing. You know, we live our lives so afraid. Did you know that fear, fear is just this feeling that you're going to end up somewhere that's beyond God's reach. Somehow you're going to just find yourself outside of his loving arms. That somehow, you know, you're going to go along, you're going to stumble, and God's not going to be able to get to you. That's the root of all fear. Do you believe when everything falls apart underneath you that what will actually happen is that you will fall into the arms of Christ? When we feel too weak to go on, his strength is made perfect in our weakness. His nail-scarred hands hold us and don't let us go because God is always loving and God is always good. See, the good thing about studying the family tree of Jesus today is that Jesus says, I'm going to take your family 
and I'm going to graft it into my family so now you are my family. I'm going to take your heart and all the broken pieces of it and I'm going to carry them to my heart so that your heart will now live inside of my heart. Because of the cross, because of the Christmas tree of Calvary, Jesus looks at your family tree and he says, you know what, you're no longer going to be the Johnson family, you're no longer going to be the Smith family, you're not going to have that name, you're going to have my name. It happens at the cross. He gives us his family and his name. It's the truest love story. Your family tree, grafted into Christ's family tree. Whatever your story, whatever your past, whatever your failure or your shame or your guilt, you get to be restored. And you get to be restoried. Your story becomes new. Christ comes to you, looks right at your family, and he says, I'll take you, and I'll take you, yeah, I know your past. Still going to take you. Yeah, I choose you. Yeah, I know, I know what you did. You don't, have, you, you don't have to tell me. I watched the whole thing. It was ugly. I still choose you. Because you're, you're going to see what I have for you. But what about, I don't care about that. But I, I don't care about that. But my family, I don't care about that. But I was so long, I don't care how long. But I went so far, I don't care how far. I choose you. I choose you. I choose you. And then Jesus stands and says, but will you choose me? The message of Christmas is that this can be for everyone. The message of Christmas is that the world is a mess. You might be a mess. Your family might be a mess. And that's why we need mess Messiah. The family lineage of Jesus throws a lifeline to all of our families. Whatever family you come from is exactly the kind of family Jesus comes from and exactly the kind of family that Jesus comes for. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, the most boring part of the Bible actually had some pretty good stuff in there. It's actually amazing that you allow some of the smudged parts of the story to remain in the Bible. Some of the sullied people of history in the closet, in the past, to remain in our Christmas story. I mean, the reason is so clear. You came from everybody. Every type of family situation. Every kind of darkness and sin. And you came for every family. Every kind of darkness and sin. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. So whoever felt like an outcast now understands they're included. Whoever felt far now understands you came near. Whoever felt unloved now knows you have loved them with all the love of heaven. And whoever felt unforgivable now understands in Christ, through his sacrifice on a cross, we are forgiven. So now it's just living in that. Now it's just living with you. Now it's just choosing you in your way. Now it's just following you. That's where our future is found. For everybody right now who needs to say, that's what I want, that's what you say. You just say to Jesus, that's what I want. You chose me, I'm choosing you. You came for me, I'm going to follow you. And just like that, just like that, no matter what your past has been, your future is new and bright and abundant and wonderful. That's some good news. And all God's people said, amen and amen. That's good news this Christmas. I hope you receive that today.